Um, so today's web talk is organized by the compendium coordinator, uh, the Institute uh, for uh, uh, Cultural uh, Politics. Uh, their Kulturpolitische Gesellschaft, if my German uh, is any good there, uh, which is the Association of Cultural Policy uh, in Germany. Uh, and it's in cooperation with the community of uh, policy experts of the compendium. Uh, this web talk is the first of its kind uh, on, uh, for the compendium. Uh, and I must say from the outset that we are recording this web talk and it will be available later uh, via the YouTube channel of the Association of Culture Policy. Um, the compendium uh, has developed since 1998 as an important resource uh, for researchers, policymakers, and other interested others interested in the study of uh, cultural policy within Europe. Uh, it now offers 43 uh, cultural policy country profiles. Um, and uh, last year, in reaction to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, the compendium provided updates on the impacts of, uh, of government restrictions and funding uh, and other policy uh, issues during the pandemic, which proved a vital resource to many uh, during that confusing time. Um, the idea of these new compendium web talks is to offer a space for discussion on current policy issues uh, amongst the uh, compendium authors as well as invited guests. Um, I would like to urge you to keep an eye out for the further forthcoming web talks on a range of other culture policy issues. So today's topic is uh, of discussion is Brexit and its impacts uh, on the cultural sector. Um, before we start, I must point out uh, two major ironies uh, in today's web talk. The first is that there's no Northern Ireland uh, representative uh, present in, in this panel discussion, but just by way of an explanation, uh, Stephen Hadley, our, our uh, compendium expert for Northern Ireland, was already booked for uh, a forthcoming talk on audience development, which you should look out for. And I think he may be in the audience today and might uh, interact with the, the, the uh, chat room. Uh, I'll do my best to cover uh, some of the implications for Northern Ireland sector uh, in, in his place. Uh, the second irony is that we are going to use a poll uh, ab about Brexit during this discussion about the impacts of Brexit, um, which uh, I hope doesn't cause any traumatic flashbacks uh, to the real Brexit re referendum uh, for those of you who are joining from the UK. Um, we're, we, we hear, uh, possibly you could see it as the the, me the children of this messy divorce um, uh, between the, the UK and the, the EU. Um, so the talk today will mainly focus on the impact in the cultural sector uh, of Brexit. Uh, the biggest impact is the loss of freedom of movement and the reduced trade of goods and services. Uh, this will be um, a focus, the, the focus of the talk will be mainly on the impacts for uh, the UK nations um, uh, particularly, but we will uh, speak about the, some of the implications of, of uh, for Europe also. Um, so yeah, the, the, uh, before, before I introduce our first speaker, uh, I'd like to engage you as an audience uh, by asking you to take part in uh, two polls, uh, the first of which uh, I'll ask Simon uh, to um, make available uh, for you to participate in, and there you go. It's just popped up. Um, so if you would, would like to uh, contribute to that poll, uh, it'd be great we could feed that into the discussion later on. And there'll be a subsequent one pop up uh, later. So um, I'll, I'll feed the, this information from the poll, polls back to the discussion later on. Uh, I'd also like to introduce you uh, to the Q&A tab. Um, so you, you have an opportunity to post questions uh, to the panelists and after uh, each uh, presenter, speaker, uh, I, I'll be able to relay those questions, uh, ask those questions to the panelists, and we'll do our best to answer as many of those questions as possible. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I am the moderator of the discussion, and uh, I'd like to thank Ulrike and Oliver for the opportunity. But uh, I'm also grateful to them that they told me that I have permission to be a non-neutral mod moderator. Um, so <laughs> coming to you from Dublin uh, in the Republic of Ireland, I have a vested interest. I, I, I'm not necessarily a, a Euro European neutral uh, on, on this 
um, there's there's too much close ties with with Britain um, uh, and the UK for that for that to be a neutral position. Um, so yeah, uh, let me introduce our our, our first two speakers uh, who will speak first about um, the Brexit impacts for England and Wales, and then the uh, creative impacts for the creative industries across the wider UK. Um, so Rod Fisher will will cover the impacts of. Uh, for England and, and the UK. Um, so let me introduce Rod. Although many of you, for many of you, you won't need an introduction. Um, uh, Rod is a, a, a founder member of the Compendium. Um, he, he works uh, with the development of postgraduate studies um, within the Institute for Creative and Cultural Entrepreneurship at Goldsmith University in London, um, with eight master degree programs in the field of cultural management and policy. He lectures in culture policy on a number of master's programs um, and he's lectured on the implications of Brexit uh, for the cultural sector since 2018. Uh, in 2021, Rod uh, is the um, uh, NCATC uh, uh, or ENCATC Fellowship uh, Laureate, um, which is an award for developing and maintaining uh, an innovative yet consistent approach uh, and commitment to positive change and remarkable and visionary leadership, creativity, and results in education, research, policy, and advocacy in the cultural management field. And anyone who has engaged with his research has benefited from his valuable contributions and innovations in the field. Uh, and well done, Rod, for this um, fellowship. Um, uh, and then uh, before Rod, Rod begins, I, I'll also introduce Amanda, uh, our second uh, speaker, uh, Amanda Stevens. Um, so Amanda is uh, Head of uh, Research and Impact with the Creative Industries Federation UK. Uh, Amanda leads the, the Creative UK group's um, work in developing insight into the UK's world-leading creative industries and demonstrating the sector's huge social and economic impact. She's also Creative UK's lead for developing research collaborations um, and is always keen to, to support and connect with others, other organizations uh, who are planning or carrying out uh, sector research. Um, Amanda has over a decade and a half of senior level research experience gained from previous roles in consultancy, academia, central and local government and the not-for-profit sector. So I might just ask Rod uh, to um, begin. Um, so Simon might share Rod's presentation. Okay. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, uh, I'd like to start with some preamble, if I may, um, in relation to Brexit. Um, just a, some basic information. The referendum represented a major constitutional issue um, and the result, though, was determined by a simple majority. Um, the UK government never envisaged the Leave campaign would win. Um, and indeed, the referendum was an attempt by Prime Minister Cameron to stop the internal bickering um, in his Conservative Party um, for a decade or so. Um, regional, there were significant regional differences in the voting. Scotland and, and London voted by a significant majority to remain. There was also a majority in Northern Ireland um, in favour of staying in the EU. Um, and many people um, who voted um, to leave the European Union were unaware of the consequences. And the result was hugely divisive um, and has resulted in a lot of bitterness, I'm afraid. Um, as far as the government's concerned, the cultural sector appeared to be a blind spot, um, as was the important uh, services sector as a whole, um, and many warnings went unheeded. And for example, the UK government consistently underestimated the extent to which the cultural and creative sector depended on creators and workers from the European Union. Um, just a little bit, a few more points about the, in, in my preamble. The full consequences of uh, culture, the culture had been blurred. Um, and uh, so far by the coronavirus pandemic, 
Um, I hope you can all see this slide. Um, well, although some issues such as artist resale rights had been resolved, many issues remain uncertain. Um, and even when issues such as copyright and related rights are governed in the UK by international treaties, some aspects have been harmonized by EU directives, for example, photographs and sound recordings. Um, and uh, in theory, um, these are implemented in national legislation. Perhaps we could come to the next slide. I see that the, uh, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Um, in theory, these are imp implemented in uh, national legislation, but following, the bre following Brexit, the national interpretation of such laws can start to move away from European Union legal um, interpretation. In addition, there's been a number of cross-border mechanisms for example, the European Union wide clearance regime for satellite and cable broadcasts, um, which will not be taken up um, by the new government, as far as we can tell at the moment. Uh, sorry, the, the current government, not the new government, the UK government. Okay, next slide, please. Just a few implications for the cultural workforce. Um, before Brexit, European Union citizens represented 8% of the UK classical music workforce, according to the Association of British Orchestras. 15% of larger museum staff, according to the Museums Association. 20% of the dance sector, according to One Dance UK. And almost 30% of a Royal Opera House employees. Now, restrictions on cultural workers from the European Union will inevitably result in a skills gap that could take a generation to replace, especially when art subjects are being squeezed out of school education in England. The UK government mantra is that the loss of European Union cultural workers will be compensated by greater opportunities for UK workers. But the big question is, how can this happen if young people are not stimulated by access to arts and the cultural experience in England? Uh, 40, some 40% 40 of visual artists travelled to Europe in the year to July 2017, according to Artist Newsletter, and 70% of musicians travelled abroad to work, especially um, the EU area, according to the Incorporated Society of Musicians. And a report by Cambridge Econometrics predicted um, uh, 27,000 creative jobs could be lost in London by 2030. Next slide, please. The impact of Brexit on artistic collaboration uh, was a key issue of concern raised in the consultation process on, the, on Arts Council England's 2020-2030 strategy. A more than 50% uh, of a thousand stakeholders surveyed separately by ICM and SQW for Arts Council England in 2017, said cultural exchange was very important um, to their work and they'd undertaken at least one international activity in the previous two years, most relating to, the, to European Union countries. For example, co-commissioning, international partnerships, hosting international artists or performing in the European Union. Manchester University uh, issued a study uh, last year uh, in conjunction with the Tom Fleming Consultancy and uh, this predicted that UK cultural organisations would be less likely to commission European artists because of continuing issues and uncertainties over Brexit. It argued that uncertainties over things like insurance and visas um, would uh, uh, make partnerships risky for organisations. And of course, without a single European Union carne, uh, touring theatre companies, music ensemble, um, TV and film production companies will face significant delays and costs at each internal border when bringing sets or instruments or equipment into the EU. And I well remember Andreas Wiesand before the European single or after the single market was agreed um, at the Treaty of Maastricht, bringing art in his car with him, artworks, when he crossed the border into France from Germany 
just to test whether the border border controls still wanted um, to see or require the um, uh, temporary custom forms to be filled out to bring his art in um, on that basis. Next slide, please. Um, some further issues on cultural cooperation work. We Euclid did a study for Arts Council England, which revealed that 1,385 projects in the arts, in the museums and creative sector, excluding the audiovisual sector, received at least £345 million from the EU between, in the 10 years between 2007 and 2016, through the cultural programmes, etc. And several hundred more projects have been funded since, at around uh, 40 million pounds a year. Investment in the UK audiovisual sector through the media sub programme Creative Europe um, helped UK film and TV producers and distributors, audiovisual festivals and markets, independent cin cinema and video games, etc. Uh, that was an important uh, stimulant um, for uh, the audiovisual sector and the uh, government's. A replacement or an attempt at a replacement program, um, to be honest with you, has not uh, uh, really doesn't match up to the former media program. And although direct funding for cultural cooperation is not large, it's been important. It's especially important for smaller organizations, but medium organizations too, not only as a financial incentive, but for connecting European cultural practitioners for a dialogue um, or collaboration or building networks across Europe. Indeed, it can be the, often be the main factor that determines whether or not they commit to engage. Moreover, um, according to an impacts report provided by Creative Europe Desk in the UK, the programme provided training opportunities, it encouraged digital innovation, um, stimulated employability, and it helped reach disadvantaged communities in the UK. And so far, there's no indication that the government plans to replace Creative Europe as it stood. Next slide, please. A uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the European Union, uh, sorry, the UK Parliament's Digital Culture, Media and Sport Committee in a report in 2018 um, made 37 recommendations. Just one recommendation to mention, uh, if I may, because I know um, these will be picked up by Amanda shortly. Uh, but this, the issuing of visas for visiting creators on the basis of salary levels, which the government proposed, uh, was seen by the Parliament's committee as a crude device for recognising the value of cultural workers from the European Union. Um, the European Union's uh, A1 system protects individuals performing in a member state um, from European, uh, sorry, uh, so, sorry, from social security deductions. And without a bilateral solution, deductions will um, be reinstated. Um, and this um, is a real concern uh, because it can represent up to 15 to 20% of salaries thus increasing costs for UK organisations and individuals travelling in Europe and perhaps pricing them out of the market. In 2017, the British Council issued a report, Our Shared European Future, which indicated a strong will across Europe for continued cultural engagement with the UK. Indeed, UK cultural organisations are seen as uh, valued partners. And then in a survey for the Observer newspaper of some 50 leading figures in the United Kingdom um, in terms of cult their cultural uh, positions, um, 46 of them uh, considered that Brexit ending free movement would have a devastating impact on the UK's cultural reputation and uh, adversely impact its soft power or, cu or cultural relations. Next slide, please. Um, some brief implications for the cultural economy. Um, Arts, Council, Arts Council England report from ICM and SQW um, indicated that 17% of earned income 
from theatre companies and 16% of income from dance companies was generating, generated by international activity, much of that from engagement with the European Union countries. And one, one illustration um, of the impact of Brexit, um, in terms of pre-Brexit and the pre-COVID-19 situation, and here, um, I hope uh, Andrew will forgive me if I just mention a, a classic illustration in Scotland, and that is the Edinburgh festivals, which before Brexit and, and COVID-19 generated £300 million a year from ticket sales, plus spin-offs for the local economy in Edinburgh. And the international festival, the major festival, engaged something like two, two and a half thousand artists, many from the European Union. And uh, almost 50% of the hospitality staff in Edinburgh came from the European Union. European Union sales have helped the UK become the largest book exporter in the world. Um, and following Brexit, the UK uh, is perceived as likely to face major competition from US publishers. And the UK publishing industry also is threatened by a possible change in copyright law that would allow the import of books from overseas without the permission of the copyright holder. And in August this year, almost 2,700 authors raised concerns with government, um, saying that the impacts would seriously affect the publishing industry in the UK, but also would affect writers' royalties. I'm going to leave you, if I may, in my brief presentation with some uh, reports and further information, which is on this last slide. Um, and you can, um, you'll see this afterwards and that perhaps you can follow up um, some of these reports if they have interested you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rod, um, <clears throat> for that really interesting presentation. Many uh, facts and figures in there. Um, uh, we now would like to in, have Amanda uh, speak uh, on the impacts for the, the creative industries in the UK. So I think Amanda's going to share her screen. Yeah. Sorry, everyone, you think I'd learned uh, about taking myself off mute so after months and months of uh, Zoom calls. Apologies. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking about the impact of Brexit on the UK's creative industries. Um, so the creative industries are a driver of the UK economy, and they have been a UK success story economically. Sorry, bear with me. I'm having a problem with my slides. Can everybody? Uh, we can see the first uh, the Fantastic. Title slide. Sorry so. about that slight tech glitch. So they've been a, um, a UK national success story. They've grown at five times the rate of the economy overall. Um, and they are broadly defined by DCMS as ar advertising, architecture, craft, design, designer fashion, games, film, TV, radio and photography, music, performing and visual arts, museums, galleries and libraries and publishing. And over the past year alone, um, the global success of content like Bridgerton, um, of artists like Dua Lipa and the video game Roki, been testament really to the power and value of the UK's creative production and content. Um, over 150 artists have achieved platinum record sales in the past decade, and our video games industry actually outstrips global competitors such as France and Canada when it comes to revenue. Um, through its creative industries, the UK has cultivated and attracted world-leading talent, um, created and supported new ideas and innovation, and unlocked the export potential of UK content and services. So the ease of movement of both people and goods and regulatory alignment on everything from qualifications to data have been absolutely crucial to the sector and its economic and global success. And it's for those very reasons that the majority of the UK's creative industries uh, were absolutely reluctant to leave the UK, uh, sorry, the European Union when it came to the time of the referendum. Um, for anybody who has been keeping up with the Brexit debate, um, a lot has been made of the impact of Brexit on the UK's fishing industry. 
um, and while cultural, uh, sorry, by co while coastal um, sovereignty has been um, a deal breaker when it comes to Brexit, the creative industries, which contribute over 82 times more when it comes to GVA, haven't been a priority in negotiations with the EU at all. So the UK's um, withdrawal from the EU from the EU has dominated political debate, obviously, since the referendum result in 2016. And in the lead up to Brexit, the extended time taken to reach a deal with the EU, the lack of clarity on what the um, leaving of the EU really meant, um, and a range of other issues have left, led to uncertainty and um, concern around um, the creative industries and across other sectors. And some of those fears still exist. So for example, at the end of last year, just ahead of ratification of the trade and cooperation agreement between the EU and the UK, the Creative Industries Federation undertook a SNAP survey across our membership on the perceived impact of Brexit. And of over 805, um, 800 people that responded, over a third reported uh, concerns with regulatory and policy barriers as, as an, uh, a barrier to exporting. Around a third indicated that the cost of exporting goods or services as a result of Brexit would be a major barrier. And just under a third of all organisations mentioned that they benefited um, from European funding, which would be taken away under the conditions of Brexit. Interestingly, only 6% of respondents told us they felt prepared at all for Brexit, um, citing that more guidance or clarity was needed about the, the implications. So the terms of the EU and UK trade and cooperation agreement um, show a number of implications for the creative industries that are starting to emerge. Um, and I'll just briefly talk about a few of those. I have just a handful over the next couple of slides. So the first of those is around post-Brexit trade and the creative industries play a major role in driving exports in the UK um, and enhancing the UK's uh, competitiveness internationally and its soft power. Before the pandemic, the sector was um, delivering around 32.8 billion in exports of services and about 13 and a half billion in exports of goods. And service exports were growing at about twice the rate of the wider economy. It's too early at the moment to kind of look at the complex implications of Brexit overall on the economy. But when it comes to the creative industries, some um, impacts are beginning to be apparent. So for example, um, quota-free uh, trade and tariff-free trade um, have been upheld, but leaving the single market and the customs union means that the UK is now subject to other barriers like customs checks, border procedures and compliance and certification requirements. And in certain parts of the creative industries, such as fashion and craft, that's um, having major issues, major problems. So, for example, um, in fashion and craft, those barriers are making UK goods less competitive in EU markets and vice versa. And trade frictions are beginning to, to materialise. Um, one example of this is increased prices. So, as a result of the application of VAT on goods at 20% from the EU, um, charges are being made at the point of sale and there are increased costs that are passed on to customers when it comes to areas like fashion and craft. Um, UK online uh, shoppers are also being forced to pay import duties on um, per items being purchased from the EU and increased fees are being applied to card payments on purchases as well. And prior to Brexit, the tax retail export scheme um, enabled tourists to the UK to buy from the UK's really diverse retail options and supported about three and a half billion pounds worth of tax free sales. Um, when it comes to the creative industries and their supply chains, the abolition of that will impact not only on the fashion sector by making luxury shopping less attractive, but will also put retail, tourism and hospitality at risk as well. Another issue clearly is restriction on freedom of movement. So as a service and content driven sector, the ability to move people around easily and the equipment and materials that they need to travel with are really important, are absolutely vital um, for the creative industries. Um, many creative organisations operate on a project by project basis and they rely on specialist temporary workers and top performers to succeed. 
and changes to those free freedoms of movement have brought a level of bureaucracy um, that make EU UK travel difficult and costly. And that's impacted hugely on parts of the sector that depend on touring and exhibiting um, as central to their work. So areas like music, performing arts, visual arts, um, film and TV. Brexit negotiations have failed to bring any agreement on visa waivers for um, short term work in the EU and UK citizens are now treated as non EEA visa nationals when they enter Europe for paid work. So that means having to no negotiate lots of different reg regulations and requirements and visa charges across each of the different EU member states and that's expensive, complex and time consuming. And for many organisations, micro businesses, for example, for performers, for freelance workers, that all make up the UK's creative industries and for creative organisations with constrained resources like those working in communities or on a not for profit basis, that administrative and cost burden is really prohibitive. And that additional bureaucracy is already damaging UK creative organisations' competitiveness. That red tape and high cost is hitting musicians and actors, for example, uh, performing and theatre touring companies and their crews and staff are being hit the hardest. Um, so an example of that in practice is the um, Association for British, British Orchestras. Um, they gathered intelligence from their members about a reluctance for EU promoters to book British artists um, for concerts in the future. Um, and similarly, um, problems posed by freedom of movement have been um, demonstrated just this year um, by issues that the National Theatre have faced. So they've had to shelve plans, for example, their 2021 European tour of the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime, um, a major um, production and very, very popular novel that they dramatised um, due to obstacles around visas and work permits. And research by equity, the UK Actors Union shows that around two fifths of its members feel that Brexit has really negatively impacted their confidence when it comes to being able to work in the arts and entertainment industry in Europe. Um, freedom, freedom of movement restrictions have made British talent a lot less attractive to um, European employers. And in that same study, uh, about a third of their members talked about having seen job adverts and casting breakdowns asking for only EU passport holders to, reply, to apply. My final point is on the loss of EU structural funds. So EU structural investment uh, and investment funds have been transformative for the UK, not just for the creative industries, but actually for communities where it's come to um, supporting the development of place shaping, supporting economic growth and focusing on areas that have the most need, advancing the, the levelling up process across the UK. Um, the UK's exit from the EU means that our creative industries aren't eligible for those funds anymore and a huge support gap exists now. Um, and examples of some of the great stuff that structural funding have been, has been able to offer the UK is, for example, through ERDS in northwest England in Cumbria, a um, largely rural and um, quite uh, uh, sort of, uh, tucked away region. Um, the region saw £48 million pounds of uh, funding um, invested through the Connecting Cumbria pro project. That actually gave 12,500 SMEs broadband access over two years, which was vital for the creative industries, supporting games in, uh, companies, visual effects companies, architects, graphic designers, and so on to set up in that area. And through European structural funds, 420 businesses in Cornwall were able to benefit from around a million pounds of funding to support internships for local residents who weren't in employment, education, or training. And that provided people with an entry point into what in the UK is a really rapidly growing industry that's primed to deliver growth at regional level. So no, no longer being able to access that funding has really had damaging or beginning to have damaging social and infrastructural and knowledge exchange um, implications for the creative industries. And we really do need a long term um, replacement urgently. That brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. In the chat, I'm just going to um, 
put a link in if nobody minds to um, a report uh, that we've created at the uh, Creative Industries. Um, it's wearecreative.uk um, for more intelligence and information on social and economic policy issues around the sector. Thanks everyone. Thanks Amanda. <coughs> That was a great presentation. Um, I, I would just like to share the results of the first poll, um, which was mainly about uh, finding out who is participating and where people are uh, coming from and, and what um, areas of work people are in. And um, so just out of like there's 15% are from UK, 75% uh, European Union and 10% outside of European Union. Um, but I'm just going to post the results so everyone can see, I think. Um, and you can uh, peruse those in your own time. Um, uh, there's a few minutes now for uh, questions questions and answers. Um, so questions posted to uh, Rod uh, and Amanda. Um, there was one particular question I wanted to come in with uh, from... Uh, Yashar Husseinli, um, uh, he made the point about the, the, the fact that during uh, COVID-19, COVID especially, there's been increased virtualization with a lot of um, movement, especially with creative industries and, and content into an online uh, uh, delivery mode. Um, so he, he wonders about the prospects of this um, virtualization in, in in respect to the problems posed by Brexit? Um, I can answer that. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I think that's a really good point. And um, that virtualization, I think we've seen increasingly during COVID as um, creative businesses and creative organizations have had to really kind of rethink how they deliver, um, be a lot more, um, I guess, entrepreneurial um, and actually pivot the way that they work. Um, so I think there is huge potential for that in certain parts of the creative industry, uh, creative industries where it's possible to very easily um, kind of co collaborate virtually. Um, so I'm thinking, for example, in areas such as architecture and design um, specifically, um, you know, that's a great thing. However, when it comes to um, the performing arts, um, music, for example, theatres, um, even museums and galleries, um, that doesn't work as well. Although it's, you know, we've seen, for example, through the UK's um, Arts and Humanities Research Council, kind of uh, initiatives to bring virtual events um, to the wider public during COVID, which has been fantastic, um, happening more and more. Um, those industries really, really depend on face-to-face, -face, on audiences and on sort of the, the physical um, so virtualization, unfortunately, isn't the answer when it comes to Brexit um, and certainly wasn't during COVID either for, for every part of the creative industry. It, it can't, unfortunately, be a, a one size fits all. And Andrew, you wanted to come in there? Yeah, just to say that I agree with all of that. Um, but I was very heartened by the fact that um, the Opera Vision platform, which is a Creative Europe funded platform, um, actually is still allowing... Uh, enabling UK product from the opera houses and dance companies onto it. And that's free digital access. It's a very, very important platform. So I'm kind of hoping that will mean that the, the, the European digital platforms that are so important, um, that actually UK companies might still be able to put their product onto those platforms and still have access to them because they're, you know, they're, they're great. I think that's a really good point, Andrew. I do think, however, that access to those platforms are, is, a bit easier and a bit more accessible when you're a, a touring company, for example, you know, a larger organization at grassroots level, you know, if you're a, a freelance performer or a musician, um, actually being able to share your content, um, you know, with wide audiences in that way, it, it's a lot more prohibited. So I think, you know, there are real pros and cons. I, I don't want to prolong this, but I, I completely agree with that. I mean, smaller, medium-scale companies are the losers um, on both the pandemic and digitization and Brexit. Uh, but I am hoping that EU moves around um, supporting the smaller scale uh, around the digital agenda will result in more platforms that they can use. And I'm hoping in turn that the UK companies might be able to participate in that. 
Um, we have another uh, contribution from Eva van Passel, uh, Department of Culture, Youth and, uh, and Media in Flanders in Belgium, who says that some, some aspects of, of virtualization in the cultural sector ha have also uh, been made difficult because of Brexit in other parts of the cultural sector. For example, the EU Orphan Works Directive um, facilitating digit digitization and further digital uses of cultural heritage and the legal uncertainty for the uh, GLAM sector uh, in the UK post Brexit. Um, and certainly like data, uh, sharing of data will uh, was harmonized before uh, Brexit and is currently not too far off harmonization, but uh, has potential to um, go on, on, on certain path, different paths maybe um, from, from now on. Um, and the uncertainty, as, as mentioned already, is, is a major issue um, for the sector. Um, I, we might, I might come back to other questions later. We've more, more time later on for, for, uh, for the questions, so I might come back to those later. Um, so um, Andrew has a, uh, introduced, always introduced himself there, but I, I, I need to do the, need to do the, the official uh, inter introduction. Um, to Andrew. So our next speaker is, is Andrew Ormston. Um, Andrew um, is uh, going to speak about the, the impacts for the culture sector in Scotland in particular. Um, so Andrew has, has worked in the culture and creative sector for most of his career. Um, he, he was director of uh, culture in Birmingham when the city launched its first screen agency and has run a number of arts venues. His most recent consultancy work uh, has taken him to Southeast Asia, uh, MENA and Around the world, around Europe, including re regular roles as as a lead expert with the European Commission. Um, current board membership include um, Cinema for All, Queens Hall uh, Concert Hall, uh, Berwick uh, Film and Media Arts Festival, and uh, Surf Scotland's Regeneration Network. Um, he's a member of the advisory group for Scotland's COVID Community Memorial Program. So um, I'll pass over to Andrew. Um, uh, who I don't think is sharing a PowerPoint. Oh, I am actually. Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> <It works>. Yes. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, thank you very much for letting me be here. Um, uh, so, um, my PowerPoint is different in tone to the others. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let me do this. Yeah. So, um, uh, actually, that. Can everybody see that? Or has that made it too big for people's screens now? I'll go back to that. Um, the, uh, so I thought basically if Brexit means bringing back imperial weights and measures in the UK, then I could actually use parchment for my slides. It seemed appropriate. Um, uh, this proverb is an Indian friend came across this old English proverb on Twitter the other day. Um, he who votes leave, but cannot walk, drive makes the whole village walk, which I thought sounded very appropriate. Um, it has particular relevance, I think, to Scotland with its overwhelming vote to remain in the EU, as, as Rod has pointed out. I think it was 62, 63% of us voted that voted, uh, did that. Uh, and we're the only country in the UK with a consistent trade surplus. So we're hurting badly from Brexit. Remember, Europe is the primary trading partner for Scotland's cultural goods and services not English-speaking North America, as quite a lot of people assume, I think. Um, and I'm not actually going to dwell on the technical issues very much, because for me, technical fixes and technical issues, you know, there needs to be a treaty between the EU and the UK, not only agreed, but implemented. And there isn't. We have a treaty agreed, but we don't have a treaty implemented. Um, so reaching agreements on technical fixes is a bit unlikely for the time being. And also, you know, we're a sector, the cultural sector and the creative sector, it's trust, it's based on trust. I mean, our relationships across the sector are based on trust. It's the basis of our work and trust is in very, very short supply between the UK and the EU right now. Um, also, as been, has been mentioned, our fundamental problems concerning freedom of movement and circulation of goods and services, they're actually shared with most other sectors from fishing to automotive to agriculture, you know, we, we're all in the same sort of boat when it comes to these, these issues. Um, the word carnet, I used to say carnet until I'd 
listen to Rod there, uh, may, know, may know some shivers down the spine of your local orchestra's touring manager, but they're hardly alone in that. This is a big shared problem. And the era of each sector arguing to be a special case failed. Um, and it's over, I think, really. That said, there may be a chance that the research, you know, the research industry is current lobbying for UK participation in Horizon 2020 may succeed. And there is an outside chance that that did succeed that the floodgates could open for other sectors. But I doubt it at a time when Westminster is making such warlike noises and seems to have no intention of implementing the withdrawal agreement. Um, so instead, I want to make two points. Uh, slide one, th this slide is, you know, what's happening in Scotland and with Scotland shows, I think, that if you work at being a good European, then Europe will still welcome you. Um, and that's something that we have been working quite hard at in Scotland. Um, this, the other point was that the internal issue, Brexit plus populism, you know, the biggest Brexit challenge for the UK cultural sector right now, maybe it's looking, it's sort of locking in of a populist far right government in Westminster and what come, and the culture wars and all of the other things. Rod alluded to the fact that in England, you know, arts are being removed both from uh, school education, but also even from higher education. So, you know, these are big challenges and Brexit is absolutely fundamental to, to this sort of process. So Brexit doesn't stop us finding ways to work with our colleagues and peers in Europe. It just makes it much more difficult. In some ways, Brexit has accelerated Scotland's determination to be European. I love printmaking and my local workshop, Edinburgh Printmakers, has just launched its Creative Europe funded project in From the Margins with partners in the Netherlands, Ireland, Denmark and Slovenia. It is the first network for studios of sanctuary in Europe offering opportunities for 30 artists from refugee and migrant backgrounds to take up supported residencies. It's work like this that should inspire us to maintain our cooperation with Europe, no matter what. Um, in the good old days when we thought the UK government might want to keep participating in creative Europe, I prepared a report for the British Council showing that for many artists and organizations, the money was only a small part of the benefits that they valued in project participation. For many in the UK, individual artists and organizations and administrators, it was transformative impacts. It wasn't just money. It was even life-changing for some of the people that I interviewed. There are some Brexit legacy funding schemes for arts and culture. And there's also some city region funding on the table right now. But just as Amanda said, um, you know, these are a pale echo of the transformative impact of Creative Europe or Erasmus and the strategic impact of European structural funds. In fact, today I read some newly published figures that just shows how minimal the current funding going out into infrastructure across the UK is compared to the impact of structural funds. So we should keep work at keeping partnerships and networks going. Scotland's newish cultural strategy emphasizes the importance of international collaboration. Scottish government is opening offices in cities around Europe with culture in the mix. And these are venues for dialogue and cooperation and cultural program. We're working very hard with our special relationships at government level and in the third sector. I interviewed Alison Harvey of um, Ireland's Heritage Council, for eight know, this week. And I was astonished at the depth of cultural dialogue and exchange between Scotland and Ireland around culture and heritage's contribution to con community development. And this is ongoing dialogue. Our links to Northern Europe have been particularly important in shaping in our vision and approach across many areas, from libraries to social enterprise to participative democracy. These are now reciprocal relationships with participation in bodies like the Arctic Circle. It was great to see our First Minister will be patron of the Constance Council Prize in December for being, quote, a committed advocate of European values. And that's something we're working at. The Scottish Parliament elections in May this year and the 2019 UK general election in Scotland last year were won on a ticket for an independent Scotland in Europe, swapping one union for another if you want. There is now a cabinet secretary for constitution, external affairs and culture and a minister for culture, Europe and international development. The actual shaping of those portfolios speaks volumes around our approach, I think. 
Small countries can lead on progressive agendas, and this chimes with the EU approach. The contrast with the EU's treatment of Ireland and the UK's treatment of Scotland is widely recognised in the lead into and after Brexit. We have had 14 years of political stability and policy development in the Scottish Government and in our cultural policies, and we can think long term based on our new cultural strategy. We can also learn from the EU's growing awareness that culture is at the heart of international relations and cooperation. It's not all plain sailing. While the Scottish Parliament has legislation to ensure that in areas of devolved power, Scots law is aligned with and keeps pace with EU legislation, and culture is a devolved power, the implementation framework with Scottish Government is not fully resolved yet. Also, when it comes to culture and creativity, ending a freedom of movement is the killer. And there is only one way for us to fix that in Scotland. So I'm going to end just with a couple of quotes from the festivals that Rod talked about in my city. There are a great collection of festivals here. Um, and this, these came up when I, I did interviews for a piece of work for the British Council that I put in the chat. First, uh, the cultural sector has a particular role to play in stimulating and maintaining the flow of ideas between Scotland and Europe. That was the International Book Festival. And then the Edinburgh International Festival rests on a commitment to dialogue with the other. It is a zone of peacemaking. And that was really in the context of the international festival people I talked to talking about returning, returning post-Brexit to its core values from 1947 of being around transnational cooperation and peacemaking. So, um, and the contrast, I think, um, with the culture wars and what's going on in, from Westminster right now is absolutely clear with those quotes. So I'm going to end with that very final question. I think a very important question. How can artists and creatives anywhere in the UK be good Europeans? How can we support, how can they be supported to do this by arts organisations, governments, cultural agencies? Um, and I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, Andrew. Um, very interesting. And <clears throat> it's very interesting that you used the, the parchment as well. Um, because <laughs> I was going to bring that up as a, an issue with materials access because of acid, acid free paper and access to that is an issue uh, for the Ireland, island of Ireland now um, because that's supplied through the UK and um, uh, it's, it's kind of the little details within that get forgotten like that. Um, so um, yeah, questions we had. <laughs> One in, uh, invader there that uh, asked a weird question there, but um, um, other than that, I was going to come back to some of the the questions that were asked or posted in advance of the um, the talk, maybe. So, and this would be more to to um, to, uh, to Andrew maybe um, initially. So, uh, how can mobility issues for artists be addressed and equitable employment opportunities in the cultural and creative sectors provided given the restrictions? So, mobility, how is there anything practical or that uh, policymakers or cultural policy experts can advise in, in regard to how do we get around these um, current problems that? Um, we're facing. Um, shall I, shall yeah, I go ahead. Um, I, mean, I, I don't think there's an easy answer. I, you know, we, we've had, and the Edinburgh Festival is a good example of this, not only the kind of Brexit scenario, but the hostile environment scenario where artists had real trouble getting visas to come in to play at the festivals. And that was, that preceded Brexit actually, but is certainly ongoing. Um, and I think, you know, I think the answer of the festivals to some extent, and probably an answer that we have to have is, is, bring, is, is not hiding that under rock, but continually uh, showing it, not hiding that away, but actually saying, making an issue of it, keeping it to the fore is a big issue because, um, you know, part of it is around rules and regulations and the like, part of it is the way that, the way they are implemented. And if we can keep this as a big issue and keep it on the surface, at least people can't implement it um, unthinkingly and cruelly without it being brought to everybody's attention, I guess is what I think. Uh, you're muted, I think. 
sorry about that um yeah i i, I kind of felt similar when when I, rod was talking about um the creative uh europe problem and and the fact that uh it was overwhelming uh, overwhelming support from the sector uh, to remain within that program um so there's obviously a need to to lobby within the uk for for the 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 um authorities to to sign up to the government for the government to, to sign up to contributing contributing to that or continuing to contribute to that program uh, and maintaining uh, participation um i don't know if that, that's what rod was thinking as well when when quoting those statistics uh, um yes um just, just very briefly just to remind people what i said basically um in relation to um the visas that would be um, offered to uh, artists. Basically, the visa system operates on the basis of um, salary levels. And we know that the artists and other creative people don't necessarily have huge salaries. And so, um, as I said, the uh, Parliament's DCMS committee uh, said that that approach is a, a really crude attempt um, at valuing cultural workers. But I'm afraid it, it's very much um, in line with the government's concern uh, in relation to um, the, not just the cultural sector, but other areas as well um, in relation to salary levels. And again, this was uh, again this was warned not just by the parliamentary committee, but in other areas as well. But the government seems fixed or fixated on this notion, if you like, of keeping people out <laughs> and, unless they're high earners. And I think that's very sad. We, we, we thought it might be possible to get special exemption for the creative and, uh, uh, sector, but so far that's completely failed, I'm afraid. I think on a practical level as well, just to build on what Rod has said about this, um, a kind of notion of keeping people out, uh, there's a burden on employers as well and on organisations. So if you are looking to bring in creative talent from overseas now. Uh, there's the, the burden of sponsor licenses and various application fees and surcharges, and also surcharges on creatives who, you know, as mentioned, don't earn an awful lot of money in many cases, like for example, paying for NHS treatment. Um, so it really does feel very kind of prohibitive and exclusionary as things stand at the moment. If I could just add as well that that um, you know, this debate started off as a skills debate. People were kind of going, oh, it's terrible, we're going to be short of these specialist skills in games development or whatever, whatever. In fact, the biggest impact in the cultural sector right now is probably just not having enough people. You know, if, you know I'm on the board of a concert hall and various other things. You know, it's getting people to run bars and be front of house. And you know, the, this is a general problem at every level of the sector. Um, and you know it can't can't be resolved by having sophisticated point systems and salary thresholds. Absolutely, that's, yeah. that's something I, I totally agree with you on that, Andrew. We um, very unscientifically recently, but ran a snap poll with uh, the Creative, Creative Industries Federation um, membership um, around skills um, shortages, and we're seeing kind of persistent skill shortages across the sector. Um, at the moment, and you know, it's one of the, one of the reasons is um, around freedom of movement. Um, so, you know, something definitely needs to be done to to address that quite urgently. Um, we have a few more questions. In um, first, firstly, uh, Jean Cedric of uh, the uh, French uh, Culture Ministry um, has asked, uh, or he has made made the the the, the point that. Um, he thinks that we, uh, we could also uh, ask about the impacts for the EU. We Obviously, our focus has been the, the impacts within the UK, and we pointed that, that out at the start. And I think it's something that we may have to come back to again uh, to discuss further. But um, it also has been uh, pointed out by um, um, uh, uh, other, other uh, Eva, Eva van Passel, uh, of the Department of Culture in in um, Flanders, um, also made the same the same point. Also, um, so yeah, um, it's it's definitely worth worth pointing out. Um, Peter Jenkel uh, also um, 
mentioned that the, the media in, in Hungary is full of self-praise of the government and in, in achievements related to culture. Uh, what do Brexiteers jubilate about? He's asking. Um, but I think I think it's that those restrictions on on movement, isn't it? Uh, maybe. Um, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of the, the EU thing, I, I you know the, a lot of the people arguing for Brexit in the cultural sector that I came across were saying we think our relationship with the EU restricts us from developing our relationships elsewhere in the world. I mean, this is not an argument that I agree with. And, um, and it's quite interesting because I was thinking about it because I work mostly internationally and almost all of that work and all those relationships came about through a European connection, through working with the EU and the Commission, through working in lots of different kind of European contexts. That's how I made the, the networks and connections to, to get me work in Southeast Asia or to get me work in the MENA countries. Um, and so if other if people are having a different experience of being able to bypass the EU and somehow it, they've suddenly got a great burgeoning of work in Africa or wherever, I don't know about it, but and it may be happening. But there is a sort of implication, an aspiration of the Brexiteers that they would bypass Europe in globalization and global relationships. And I suppose if that worked, that would have an impact on the EU, I think. But, um, but I don't know if it would work or not, really. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so we in relation to our schedule, I have a few uh, tasks ahead. So um, one is to launch our, we're going to have a second poll, um, which will fix Brexit. No, it won't. Uh, it will uh, just ask you further questions about about your your relationship with it. Um, but uh, the, the second task is uh, to um, speak briefly about Northern Ireland and the, and the implications for Northern Ireland. Um, so uh, I, might, I might begin with that, uh, and then we'll come back to Q&A uh, thereafter. Um, so Nor Northern Ireland um, and the Republic of Ireland protocol uh, is, is the, the uh, legislation within Brexit, I guess, that, that governs the special relationship of Northern Ireland uh, within, within this new, arra new arrangement with, between Europe and, and the UK. Um, so it, it allows Northern Ireland uh, continued participation, participation in the EU customs union and single market for goods, notwithstanding the UK with, withdrawal from the EU. Um, uh, there, there are also, uh, it, it also uh, recognizes the Good Friday Agreement and uh, the, the citizens' rights in Northern Ireland to, um, to uh, an, a Republic of Ireland passport, as well as a, a British passport. <clears throat> Um, so there's a there's a quite a unique uh, situation in Northern Ireland um, in relation to um, in, in, in their uh, relationship to Brexit. <clears throat> uh, Northern Ireland vo voted overwhelmingly to remain in in Europe, um, but I'm not sure whether if if we had another vote on, uh, on it, whether we would have the same results given the changes in in the politics uh, since. Um, <clears throat> there are real um, concerns from the sector around the future of access to European funds, um, such as the peace funds, Ireland funds, and there were commitments from the UK government as well as the uh, uh, European Union um, to, to commit to, to those program, programs like Peace, uh, peace 4 and Interreg um, and, and other such funds. Um, uh, Creative Europe is interesting in that Northern Ireland will be regarded as a third country uh, in application, so they they can con uh, con um, continue to contribute, but uh, it, there there is a bureaucratic kind of uh, or administrative burden to having a third party within within uh, those applications, and it, they may be less attractive as as partners within those, and there's a fear around that, um, and. The, the um, regional development funds was a major boost to the uh, the sector uh, right across the board, um, and there's a, a real fear about um, uh, the loss of access to regional development funds. Um, so uh, there's a, there's also a number of issues with uh, ATA Car Carnet or Carnet, uh, which, whichever we decide uh, is the correct pronunciation. Um, and things like cabotage and uh, 
social security issues as well um, ar around uh, freedom, people moving between uh, states as well. Um, so there, there are lots of uh, very particular issues, but most relate to movement of people and movement of, of goods and services. Um, uh, and an interesting one is the, uh, the museums uh, sector is highly reliant on the regional development funds. A lot of um, the museum sector has uh, been built upon uh, those funds. So what will replace those funds in, in future developments? There's a number of uh, uh, programs that are, are um are uh, in fear of losing funding uh, to continue and um, also um uh so yeah funding funding is an issue visas uh, are an issue there it's it's not uh there's not there's not a free movement uh uh between the northern ireland and and, and uk there are there are um uh bureaucratic issues and uh, uh, in in that process that that uh, create frictions i guess uh, within the movement um and uh the 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 protocol doesn't um doesn't solve all of those uh, issues certainly um but the the biggest issue is is the real possibility of a return to violence in in northern ireland um and that, and that would be my major concern in relation to uh, cultural change uh, as, a, as a result of Brexit. Um, the conflict in Northern Ireland relates to rights to connect with and celebrate cultural identity allegiances either to Irishness or Britishness. Um, there was a total denial of this reality in the British political debate uh, when, the, when the Brexit vote occurred. Um, it was seen as a, a side issue um, uh, 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 that wasn't majorly relevant. Um, a lot of the, the debate centres uh, uh, and continues on, on where the border lies um, uh, and uh, the, the, where the border lies uh, between Europe and the UK in terms of either a land border or a sea border has cultural consequences. Um, so uh, I, I grew up on the border. My father was a customs officer on the border uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, so I, I know what living with a border is like and, and what it, uh, the frictions that it creates in terms of movement of people and, and goods and services. But um, the, the protocol suggests a, a more of a sea border, uh, as it's described by the loyalist community. And this, this has... Um, um, Boris, has, uh, Boris Johnson has claimed frictionless trade and it'll be very easy with the, the digital revolution and so forth. And... Um, it, it hasn't proven to be that that simple uh, so far and and there have been a lot of restrictions created um and uh, so uh yeah the, the 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 loyalist community in their title is loyal they are loyal uh, citizens of 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 britain and um it, their their cultural ident identity is is it's it's enshrined in in uh, this union with with britain and to the, to that that community um, as a sea border uh, creates a, a barrier between um, their um, fatherland, motherland, or whatever way you want to mainland, or whatever way you want to put it. But um, this this is called cu causing cultural cultural conflict, and it's it's raising tensions in Northern Ireland uh, that may lead to um, a return in uh, to uh, greater violence in uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, so yeah, there are there are um, cultural consequences outside of the, the direct cultural sector uh, to uh, citizens' rights and uh, cultural rights within within Northern Ireland. Um, so yeah, if we could launch the the second uh, poll, if it hasn't been done already, uh, there we go. There's the second survey. Um, so if, if participants could. Um, uh, Fill fill this poll out, and I'll share the the results in um, in a few minutes. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if we if we if anyone has any further questions, it, it would be uh, great if you could ask those now. And um, so we have another <clears throat> uh, fifteen minutes or so, I think. Um, so one question I wanted to come back to was from Lena uh, Kirschensteiner. Um, who was asked, um, 
you've already touched on this subject, but I would I would like to know um, a little more about the copyright and fair re remuneration challenges for creative workers in the UK. Would anyone like to answer that? Um, I can kind of briefly give, um, I guess, an overview on that. I mean, um, obviously with the creative industries, um, things like patents, uh, patents, um, copyright, uh, trademarks uh, for things like design are um, crucial um, and not just because of you know, the, the value of that, but um, to enable people to be able to scale up their ideas. Um, I think one of the issues with Brexit has been that there's been a grey area around intellectual property. Um, and the UK has been doing kind of numerous trade deals with countries across the world. Um, but some of those have standards that are far lower than the UK when it comes to copyright and intellectual property. Um, and so that means actually that there is potentially an issue when it comes to maximizing the income from design from creativity back into the UK um, and back to the creators who, who've made those things. Um, so there needs to be, I guess, something within negotiations going forward that um, does more to protect intellectual property, um, basically a, a better regime um, that countries that are signing up to TCAs with the UK sign up to and that the UK better um, enforces as well. Thanks, Amanda. Andrew, you want to come in there? Uh, just a couple of things. One, one is on, on the um, remuneration issues and, and all that side of, side of things. I mean, there's, there hasn't been any sign that, that, that any, any of the UK governments are looking to undermine the kind of minimum wages and, you know, uh, safeguards for, for minimum wages and the like. Um, and in fact, seem to be going a little bit the other way right now. Um, and embracing them. Um, in Scotland, we are we are pursuing the fair work agenda, which is an international agenda. So we are collaborating with other European countries on how we approach implementing the fair work uh, agenda, which is very interesting. And it's you can read about it if you look up. It's a very interesting. And, and there is a big bit of work going on right now in the cultural sector in Scotland about how we might be able to apply the fair work agenda uh, across our sector. Um, so um, what was the other half of the question again? It was... So it was on, on fair remuneration uh, challenges um, for the creative workers. Yeah, and there was another bit to the question as well, I think. You um, so the, the first part was uh, about the copyright. Um, oh yeah, I mean, I think the only comment on that is yes, I think there are concerns, but I mean, I. Personally, I, my observation would be that I think the EU and the UK are less far apart ideologically on copyright than some of the other areas around culture. You know, it's not a coincidence that we're not in Creative Europe or Erasmus. It's a, it's a cultural decision. It's about it's it's driven by an ideology. Whereas I don't see that big difference between the EU and the UK on on issues of of um, copyright and, and ownership. Um, there's another question from uh, Andre uh, Swacker. Uh, did COVID-19 pandemic change the opinions and attitudes to Brexit? Um, I, 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 I kind of thought that uh, it, it's been hard to judge the true impact of Brexit because of uh, the, the pandemic. And it's been hard to gather any data. Um, like if you think of the, the movement of musicians uh, throughout the, the British Isles or this kind of thing, it would be great to have that data to prove that there's been a tangible effect. So we haven't really been able to do that, I guess. I'd agree with that, Parikh. I think, um, you know, when you look at the economic impact of, um, you know, recent times on the creative industries, it's really hard to tell what, what, has, um, what the line of delineation is between COVID and Brexit, um, it's as though they've really compounded one another. Um, you know, we, we signed the, the deal, um, unfortunately, to leave uh, the EU in the middle of Brexit and there have, uh, sorry, in the middle of COVID. Um, and there have been sort of huge implications for um, investment, for exports and imports, et cetera, of creative content. But the extent to which we can tell whether that's because we're in the middle of a pandemic 
um, all because of the negative impacts of Brexit, it's really, really unclear. Uh, I, I actually think there is, has been a very strong impact in, in, along these lines, which is, you know, the, the, the UK figures, as you know, accumulated figures for infections and deaths are, are catastrophic, you know, compared to the rest of Europe now. I mean, we've had a, a huge amount more accumulated deaths per capita. We've got all, you know, health worker deaths of much more than anywhere else in Europe per capita. Current infection levels at over 40,000 a day are just disastrous. So, and that's to a degree because of Brexit, because we were removed from a pan-European approach to it and adopted this, this rather strange kind of herd immunity thinking, which is still there when it comes to kids, for instance, in, in the UK. Um, and of course, there is a huge impact for our sector because we are operating from a, a situation where we are much more curtailed by levels of infection and deaths and public safety than many other places in Europe right now. And I, I find this in my work now. It's kind of you know, um, so uh, so I think there is a very, very big impact, actually, which is we handled COVID differently because we weren't in the EU. That has been very, very counterproductive for us, and that is impacting on our sector, is my view. Eva van Passel, before I hand over to Rod, Eva uh, van Passel has made the point that um, she, she agrees that it, um, it, it has... Uh, Made it made it more tangible uh, the the impacts of Brexit in some regards in relation to um, EU free travel with with different uh, jurisdictions having different rules around um, restrictions and and, and uh, movements of people because of the the, the pandemic. Um, uh, but yeah, Rod, you wanted to come in there. Um, yes, I was, I was simply going to say that um, as I said, I think in my presentation the. Um, situation uh, with COVID has masked the real impacts of Brexit and, and the government hides behind that, basically saying, oh, well, it's not the effects of Brexit, it's the effects of COVID. Um, and of course, we know that the government's approach to COVID anyway, is, it's, it's basically, we've, we, we say in the UK that it's always around kind of closing the stable door after the horse has bolted. Um, to use a, a, a UK expression, um, and uh, I think uh, until COVID, the COVID situation has been uh, ameliorated at least, uh, we're not going to really understand the real impacts of Brexit, um, which are serious, as we've all tried to point out, um, and uh, it's very sad because just as COVID has divided the population in terms of whether people should be vaccinated or not, Brexit has really, really seriously divided um, uh, attitudes. And I feel very sorry. I mean, I, can, I can't remember in my lifetime uh, such a division as has occurred um, around uh, Brexit. Um, and also uh, my, some of my European friends who live in London, for example, do not feel welcome here anymore um, because this, this attitude which has been stoked by the Leave campaign and by some of the media has made us um, a, a country which is not as kind or gentle if it ever was um, uh, uh, today so it's a, it's a it's a, an alarming um, scenario I think for the immediate future. Um, before I wrap up uh, we can't leave on that negative note. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. Who's, who's going to offer the, the light of hope here? Um, uh, either Andrew, Andrew or Amanda or Rod? Both, both of us probably have something to say. I mean, my, mine was, as I said in the presentation, I, I, I think just because there are so many barriers in face of our corporate, if we're determined to have European relations and work with Europe, our colleagues in Europe, and we will find ways to do it. And we are beholden to do that uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, so we should be working hard. And I think we have to do that in the, in the light of day. We don't do it behind the scenes. I think we should be very upfront as a sector mm -hmm. and pursue that uh, um, defiantly. Um, and I, I, think, I think we are all responsible for that. So, um, so I think there is, there is hope. And of course, in the Scotland's position, 
where you know our, our kind of ideology hasn't changed in the same way and we are still progressive center left and pro-european um you know that we are increasingly i think having a very warm relationship with uh europe um, at all sorts of different levels so i think that's that's kind of an optimistic thing um, um i did, sorry on. i was just going to say i would agree with um andrew on there i think there is hope um i think the creative industries are fantastic when it comes to innovating um and doing things differently we've seen that during covid where um you know the creative industries and you know the cultural sector kind of changed the way that they work in order to survive um and i think there will be kind of innovation when it comes to collaborating internationally co collaborating across Europe in some way and um, you know there will be some way to work out how we do that um, as a sector um, and as a group of uh, creative people it's just uh, yet to happen but um, I agree with that kind of a very optimistic view of yours Andrew. Yeah um, I, I, I agree totally as well and Rod, Rod do you want to no, I, I was just going to endorse what Andrew said and Amanda have said, basically, it's just going to be a difficult time. And the other hope, of course, is that the current political attitudes in the UK will, uh, at some stage, uh, be changed. Um, but it's going to take a while, I'm afraid. The, the poll, the second poll results I've just posted there, but um, the, the uh, most striking problem of, uh, for the culture sector of Brexit, it has been highlighted as reduced opportunity for exchange and cooperation. And this kind of reflects uh, what's just been said about um, uh, the solution um, in terms of um, uh, getting getting around this but through association and creating recreating the the, the connections that that are potentially lost through um, through Brexit. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is through the compendium of, of uh, culture policies. Um, uh, which is uh, obviously an example of uh, cooperative cooperation between um, between uh, different countries within the, the area of Europe, uh, and whether Brexit exists or not. Um, so I'd, I'd like to uh, wrap up uh, and, and thank the panelists uh, uh, and the participants for for uh, engaging with the discussion. Um, I think it's been been a, a very interesting discussion. Um, to all the registered participants, uh, we'll send next week an email with the, the link to the YouTube channel for the, the recording, if you want to access that. Um, and this is the first web talk uh, of the compendium. There will be more uh, to come, so keep an eye out for those on the compendium website. Um, um, and then for more information on cultural policies in various uh, countries in Europe, uh, check out the website, the culture policy website. Uh, uh, culturepolicies.net uh, website uh, and if there's any questions uh, or comments um, post talk um, you can contact Ulrika or Oliver uh, in the, the um, Association of Culture Policies in, in Germany. So thank you everyone and uh, uh, as the sun has set behind me I, I, uh, we, uh, and, and behind Rada also um, and Amanda, I see you there. So we, we, we uh, uh, say farewell and, and thank you for your participation.